time participant of IRCP, and um, I'm, I'm really sorry he's not here, so hopefully you'll send kind words back to Tony. Um, St. John, Western Australia put a call out to all 5,000 paramedics to give them the opportunity to uh, apply for a chance to attend this meeting. And 500 paramedics applied for that opportunity, and they sent uh, three paramedics and two managers. And so we want to say thank you for that. And also, a recent development in Western Australia is that St. John has acquired a, a, a uh, practice, a physician practice, a group of physicians and are going to be operating uh, clinics in Western Australia. So congratulations to you guys on that as well. We're really glad you're here. Thank you. Okay, so Matt um, Leonard. Oh, it's your turn. Okay. All right, so we have 15 amazing presentations for tomorrow, and I only have six of them. So that means nine of you are in trouble, especially the ones that start right away at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. So before you leave today, I need those over at my desk or email to me, please. Okay. So Matt Leonard, I had to ask him how to pronounce his last name, uh, did a webinar for us recently that I thought he was repeating here today. But one of the cool things that Matt has done, you've got a poster? Do you have a poster on that? Um, well, let's put it up. One of the cool things that Matt did as part of his PhD project was try to predict where community paramedics visits would occur and he had great success with that. And so if you get a chance to look at his poster and, uh, uh, and uh, talk to him about that project, I know that you'll be, it's very interesting. Um, and you can also go into the archive, uh, IRCP archive and replay the session that he did for us. Um, and I have all of the presentations from today already up on the IRCP website so you can grab them in PDF form. Um, once Ann's husband gets busy and segments the uh, videos for us. We'll post those on the other side of the page. So to get there, you go to ircp.info, click on Meetings, and then click on 2016, and you'll see all of the presentations on the left-hand side. And as we continue in tomorrow, we'll, once Ann gets those presentations, we'll start posting those as well. So Matt Leonard is, and uh, is Andrew Costa? Okay, so Matt's going to present on behalf of him and Andrew on investigating paramedic service use by home care patients. Matt, thank you for being here. Disregard. So let's start with a really simple question. Do home care clients use paramedic services? Show of hands who says yes. All right. Now, the question is how often or when? There's some, some work to be done there, and that's, that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, so there's, there's uh, my contact information and my Twitter feed, and I put a cute cat on because looking at cute animals is supposed to increase focus and productivity, and we're getting later in the afternoon, so I'll try and make this, uh, this a bit interactive and, and uh, interesting for you as best I can. Um, now, who in the room is familiar with InterI? See that? Oh, that's great. Good. That's the, I'm happy to see that because um, this research project took uh, home care assessments done by uh, care coordinators through, um, through the Community Care Access Center in the Hamilton region. Um, and Andrew Costa, um, through his research, d developed and validated a tool called Divert, which was an algorithm that looked at uh, characteristics of these patients and whether they were likely to return 
to the emergency department. And when I first met Andrew, I said, well, how do they get there? Um, and so that's, this is the, the divert tool. Uh, it's really dominated, sort of the high risk, have uh, previous use, um, cardiorespiratory symptoms. Um, there's a few other things in there around mood and UTIs. But it gives uh, six different levels of the risk for home care clients and whether they end up going repeatedly to, to the emergency department. Um, and this is really just a, a very preliminary investigation. So I had um, six months worth of data, which is not, not a lot, um, in the Hamilton, Niagara, Haldeman, Brant area of Ontario. I'll show you a map of where that is for context. Uh, and there were two parts of uh, what we were looking at. One was whether or not the patients went uh, to the ED by ambulance. And the other was whether or not they were discharged. So discharged or other, other could include admission, transfer to a, a different setting, or, um, or died. Um, so we looked at the variables, um, including the class on the divert scale, and then other, other factors. And we did this using uh, logistic regression. So this is the, the area of study which is uh, to the, that blue area to the south is Lake Erie. The blue area to the north is uh, Lake Ontario. So it's sort of the, the western end of Lake Ontario. And to give you a point of reference, I would recommend flying and not driving because it looks like there's a lot of construction along the way. Um, so, all right, let's answer the question. So do they go uh, by ambulance? Well. Uh, good for me that I'm just starting my PhD studies. I got some more work to do. Uh, the divert scale, not too predictive of whether or not they go by ambulance. Um, again, this is preliminary investigation, and when I look at more data, maybe that will change, but the things that, that were statistically significant were uh, their age, gender, whether they're living with a caregiver, uh, whether they're in a rural setting or not, and an interesting one was uh, an interaction term uh, between gender and caregiver. And so what that means is that, so uh, if they're female, they're 36% more likely to go by ambulance. If they're living with a caregiver, they're 25% more likely. But if they're female and living with a caregiver, that's decreased. So. That means that we're talking about uh, males who uh, live with a caregiver and females who don't live with a caregiver. Um, and then the next part was looking at whether or not um, after their transport, whether these patients were, were discharged. Um, also interesting here, the least likely to be discharged were at the opposite ends of the risk scale. So what that says to me is if there's a low risk scale, that everything seems fine and then there's some event that's pretty significant and they end up being admitted. Or the level six, they're, they're significant comorbidities. These are sick individuals and they end up getting admitted. So what? <laughs> I'm not telling you anything you didn't know, really, right? Like, uh, so the theme at the Paramedic Chiefs Conference this week was bridging gaps, and, and that is a picture of the, from outside my Airbnb that I'm staying in. And so we got some more work to do on the bridge. Uh, I can't tell, actually, if it's being built or taken down. I, that's, anyway, that's a different discussion. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, where, where we're going from here after we, okay, so we've, we've got the data around um, home care clients. Uh, the inter-eye home care assessment is a very, 
robust uh, data set that gives a really great understanding of the patient's baseline. Um, and what I'm doing in my research is um, called the CARPE study. So um, Jonathan, thanks for the movie references this morning. I thought I'd throw one into of some 90s movie, uh, Dead Poet Society. Um, so from the Latin carpe to seize to pluck. So we've got big data, and we've heard a bit about that today. So let's pick out the risk factors associated with these patients. Um, and I have to be honest with you. Um, Ron Myers was, was talking about the, the CSA group, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be part of the technical committee because standards excites me. Uh, I know a lot of people can glaze over when, when some of the stuff is being talked about, but I'll put it in this con context for you. So we have uh, four different nations uh, represented here, and I want you to think about, for all of the, the, um, the paramedics, uh, what you were taught when you were, very, when you were in school to be a paramedic in your rapid head-to-toe assessment, that 90 seconds you're doing the head-to-toe assessment. How different do you think that assessment was between Australia and the UK and the US and here in Canada? Very different? Who thinks it was very different? Show of hands, very different. It's gotta be different across, we're all in different places. Nobody. So uh, the next question is, well, what, what did that 90 second rapid assessment do for you? How did it inform your clinical judgment? This is what uh, sort of thinking in terms of what are the assessments that we're doing in community paramedicine? What are they doing for you? And how do they inform your clinical judgment? Um, so that's, that's in brief, uh, the question around the home care clients. Um, and I'm also, uh, I'm really pleased to see the show of hands around the, the inner eye tools and I'd be really happy to discuss it more with you. Uh, one of the things is, uh, I guess I've, I've come to, to be a, a sold on the concept. For those who aren't familiar with inner eye, the idea is that throughout every sector of healthcare, clinicians do assessments. And we've talked about big data and sharing of information across the continuum, standardizing assessments and being able to share the information as the patient travels from healthcare sector to healthcare sector, reduces redundancy and it improves the ability for, um, for patient care. So um, I don't know if there's time for questions now or, or at the next break um, or you can drop me a line um, I'm really interested in bringing more people on board with with the carpe study so if you're interested in that then um, let me know as well thanks but we can introduce ourselves if you like.
Okay. I wrote. <laughs> Okay. I'd love to introduce my team. Awesome. Um, this is Kelly Prime. He is the operations director for Midway and Shamrock Ambulance. Perfect. And Kelly Tukarchuk, and she is the, I'm trying to say their titles correctly, the manager of home care many East. places, East, East and, and South, South. Yeah. of Saskatoon Health Region. Mm -hmm. And I'm Sherry Julie, the manager of pre-hospital emergency medical services for Saskatoon Health Region. So we're here to talk to you today about uh, a client that we work with in home care, and our title is Expanding Inter Interdisciplinary Team Models to Enhance Client Care um, in Rural Settings. Okay, so we're pretty excited to be here to talk to you today um, about uh, our implementation of a collaboration between home care and the community paramedics. And we're gonna use one of our case studies to sort of walk through how we developed that programming and built the team to provide services in the client's home. To be smarter than that thing. There we go, okay. Um, so for those of you that are not from Saskatchewan, um, as of today, although it sounds like it'll be changing, we have 13 rural health authorities within the province. There's some giggling. Our budget just came down a couple days ago, so that's impending change is coming. So today we're going to be talking about the Saskatoon Health Region, which is the largest geographic region without, within Saskatchewan. It's about 34,000 square kilometers if you drew around it. And there's quite a few um, residents within the Saskatoon area, but today we're going to be talking about the rural areas. So it's a vast geography that also houses, if you add everybody together um, that doesn't live in Saskatoon, to a, a fairly large caseload. So when we talk about rural, um, we're really talking about rural, rural here. Um, so middle of nowhere, middle of everything rural. So Wadena Wynyard is about 200 kilometers east of Saskatoon. And so that just gives you an idea of, of what we're actually talking about um, in our delivery of care model. So within the, the program, we're going to be talking a little bit about um, sort of our rural community care objectives. So some of our challenges, one of the biggest ones is our staffing level. So how do we recruit and retain staff to provide services and also access to resources in, within our rural environment. Um, in order to do this, we've developed collaborations with our community paramedics, with our OTs and PTs that travel in that, um, those regions and also with our, our long-term care facilities to enable us to provide care. So many of you are really familiar, in fact, probably everyone in this room with many of the EMS reviews that have come out um, that support the community paramedicine journey in Saskatchewan, in particular, of course, the 2009 EMS review, which is uh, uh, a lot of people know about. But specifically in Saskatoon Health Region, we also had a, two, a review done in 2010, and that was a rural health strategy. So that outlined a changing direction for EMS as well with some key recommendations. Um, the high quality of care as well. So we've been really challenged for quite some time to expand the delivery of services uh, frequently utilized by people in our communities on an outreach and mobile basis. So currently, uh, the paramedics uh, that belong to Midway Ambulance, uh, we are currently engaged in these projects with the majority of our uh, time being spent on the assessment, the IV hydration, IV antibiotics, and phlebotomy and the enhancement of support with the acute care services. Yeah. So just a little snapshot of, of the Winyard area. Uh, Midway Ambulance has four service areas. We are in partnership with three regional health authorities which are all doing different things at different times. Uh, we do about 1,600 calls uh, a year, so not a very large amount. Uh, about 400 per site, give or take. Um, we, have, uh, multi we have about 25 paramedics of all different ranges um, and currently enhancing to the uh, advanced care paramedic level 
in a couple of other sites. Um, we are engaged with two or three um, acute, small rural acute care centers, uh, two within the Saskatoon Health Region that have about 11 acute care beds between the two of them, um, or in each, each site. Okay, so this I want to introduce you to two of our friends. So this is Adolf and Margaret, and we do have permission to use both their picture and their actual names. And it was important for us to be able to use their names because that's in home care how we approach client care. It's, it's not client X or client number one, two, three, it, it's Adolf and Margaret. So Adolf became a home care client back in 2008 and really had very little interaction with home care at that time. And in December of 2014, his care needs started to change. He was falling at home and, and things just weren't going as well. So home care implemented some more services, but right after Christmas, um, we did a, a transfer lift repositioning, we call it TLR, an assessment, and we determined that he needed to be a two-person assist. And in, in Winyard, I don't have two staff members um, in home care that work in the evening. So the options really were, does he go to long-term care? Um, do we need to move him out of the community to a private care home? The closest one is 30 minutes away. Or is there a way we can do it differently? So at that moment, we picked up the phone and we engaged our community paramedics and, and asked, can you guys become and be our second person assist when we're unable to put two staff members inside the home? So as you can see, so Adolf went from a, a two person assist with a pivot transfer to using a sit stand lift. Um, for a very short time, we used a mechanical lift in the home and then we, um, his final lifting technique was with a ceiling track lift that was installed um, in about July of 2015, excuse me. So some of the challenges we see in the rural area, and we're not unique, rural areas are, seem to always have the same problems. You get the heads nodding in the crowd. and So the big one is our staffing levels. So we have seven CCAs with positions and, and comes and goes, but usually two casual staff. And so we have a total of 45 home care clients in Winyard and Adolf himself was up to 44 hours a week of service. So if you think we have basically a full-time position running just with this one client, plus we're needing to meet the needs of the other 44 clients. Um, we have one home care nurse and one assessor that works as well to develop the care plans. So recruiting and retention is difficult. Uh, if you're not from Winyard, you're probably not traveling out there to live there, um, unless you have some kind of a tie. So we had to figure out how we're developing our care team. Access to resources, OTPT, I think there's about a 1.8 full-time equivalent position of an occupational therapist that works within rural SHR. So that's all of the rural areas. So there's not a, a, um, an easy link into that system. So in order to provide services to our, to our clients, because I can't just do it all on my own, we really needed to develop our collaborative models. And so one of the first ones is looking at our community paramedicine and, and really working with them to have our paramedics work to the full scope um, of the practice of the paramedics. So we developed a relationship with home care and a relationship with the family and we became uh, more than just partners, we became a team in providing care to our community. Our occupational therapists and physical therapists, they were amazing. Um, like I said, there's not a lot of them in the rural area and the time that they dedicated and their impact on how we provided care and how the patient received that care was huge. So when we first started our, um, our care in the home, we were really working in silos. So home care was doing their thing, paramedics were, were going on their lens, um, how to provide care. We had our OTs, PTs, and, and the family. And, and although we were providing really good care, um, the patient was safe and the, the staff were safe, we really weren't being effective because we weren't working together as a team. We all were coming with our separate lenses at this time. So in July of 2015, uh, and it was right around the time that Adolf was changed into um, from a sit-stand lift to a total lift, the, the Kelly's team came to us and said, you know, we have some concerns about what's going on. 
um, the family and the paramedics had really created quite a bond and we did a measure called stop the line. If, you're in, if you know about lean um, and lean methodology, it really just means that you, somebody puts up their hand and says we need to stop and we need to get together and figure out what our next steps are going to be. And so in July of 2015, we met um, as a team group. So we had uh, paramedics, myself from home care, our occupational therapist, our physical therapist, and the family, and of course, Adolf and Margaret. And we sat down and went through all of the steps and developed what our care path was going to be together. And what it did was put us all on the same page. Uh, everybody was hearing the same information so we could move together. So from that point on, this model is really what we started to look like. Um, and this is where we really started to deliver some excellence in care um, for our client. So in December of 14, we were engaged by Home Care and got the Saskatoon Health Region involved. And we started working on a schedule for Adolph's care. Uh, Kelly schedulers came to us and on a weekly, weekly basis, they assessed the, the times that their crews could go in and what times they needed assessment. So in January, in December, we, we, in the middle of December, we started it, uh, but this data shows from January 15th all the way to February 16th where Adolf eventually moved uh, into a home. Um, every Friday afternoon, the scheduler would contact me with the, with the schedule of the care aids and the times that they were short. So I would take that schedule, apply it to our schedule, engage our paramedics, and we would schedule somebody in. If we couldn't meet the needs of those uh, visits or uh, assistance, I, en I engaged the other paramedics in the other areas and brought them down at times. So because I'm the pencil pusher of the group uh, and I have to respond to my senior leadership, uh, we, we crunched some numbers about what is the cost of care. So how much did it cost us to actually do this? And uh, the, the chart really shows the different levels. We have our CCA costs, we have our um, paramedics costs as the green. The in-kind is um, Kelly and his team, they didn't charge us when they responded to care between their normal working hours, which they didn't have to do that, but it was part of their buy-in to this project. Um, and it also made it financially feasible. Uh, some of the other things they also did is um, we operate, although they're not unionized employees within the region, we do operate off of the the union, I guess CBA that um, our in-scope employee paramedics would utilize and they were willing to waive some of the three-hour callbacks. We paid them for an hour instead of three hours, which again made this possible. Uh, so the red line across the top is the average cost of long-term care. We averaged it at about $187 a day. And so you can see for most of the months, we actually ran underneath what the cost of long-term care would be to the system. Um, it's important to note that this project was funded through as a Home First program, um, so we did receive an injection of money from the Saskatchewan government um, that enabled us to do an enhanced care in the home. But you can see from July through November, there was an, an increase in usage, and does anyone have any idea why? Just shout it out if you do. Pardon me? The weather, um, not quite, but you're close. It is a season. We're talking rural Saskatchewan. Farming. Ah, oh, yeah. So the, they're in the field. The family was in the field. And so when you're looking at home care and you're looking at your collaborations, understanding the population and how those service needs are going to flux is huge. And so in those months, we did bridge over top, but you can still see cost effective um, overall. So presently, we have these projects going on uh, in the future, in the very near future. It, it, our community paramedicine is kind of every day evolving. Um, we are, have just entered, and Dr. Mendez didn't uh, introduce this today, but we will be doing the doctor in a box on a community paramedicine platform and the emergency, uh, an emergency uh, response platform where we're engaged with pediatric uh, specialists and the cardiologist specialists and using his technology to deliver care uh, on emergency calls and 
on a community paramedicine basis, engaged with our local physicians and nurse practitioners. So some of our learnings and next steps, I think number one is don't let the perceived lack of resources stop you from providing care. Um, I think it's easy that quick no comes up, no we can't do that, but you can. You just have to look outside of what your normal box of care is. Um, embrace extending that circle of care to non-traditional role models. So we hadn't really worked with paramedics before. Um, you know, we're still figuring everybody out, but the development of the team and the understanding of each other has grown so much that it really enhanced the professions on, on both sides of the groupings. Um, so we're going to be doing some continued team building between home care and paramedics. We did do a post-collaboration survey with both aspects to see what the feedback was from the staff and I think there's some learnings we'll go back to and definitely ways to continue to grow our team. And Margaret, if you know Margaret, you would love Margaret. Um, she has sayings that go everywhere but um, one thing she said to me one day, I think I had been telling her no, and she looked at me and said, the only thing a person cannot do is bite their own ear. And I kind of giggled at it because it's kind of funny, and then I thought, wow, like how often in your life is someone asking you to bite your ear? Like not very often, so that means the possibilities are really endless, and it's, it's actually exciting. It, it almost frees you to do more. So we did an interview with uh, Margaret and Judy. So Judy is one of the children of Adolf and she was incredibly engaged in the care with Adolf. And so we wanted to get from their perspective this collaboration and what it meant to them. So, and shouldn't there be a bar at the bottom that we press? Move the mouse. There we go. I think it's coming. Thank you. There should be sound there. we pull that flash drive out, Anne? <laughs> First, we will come get them up, dress them, 
and I didn't think they'd go in such detail as like they wash him, they make sure he's got deodorant on, they comb his hair, they do everything for him because he's incapable of doing it. So at first I thought, well, they'll just probably get him up and the rest will be up to us, but they look after all aspects of his personal hygiene and his care. They actually uh, comfort him like, okay. They, they crack a little joke sometimes, you know, and he laughs at that. Yeah, like they really make him feel at home. They make him feel like uh, he's a person, not just an object that they have to deal with. You know, they they uh, attend to him in a professional way. Well, they, they treat him with respect. You know, I just can't say enough about them. They are just very good. You have an exceptional t team there, yes, yeah. you sure do. Really good. Well, we actually thought that there was something maybe more wrong with Dad. Like we thought there's probably some, how can I say, an illness or something that we don't see that they see. We just presume the wrong thing. Like we presume maybe we were kind of scared at first. Oh, when the team comes, it's actually, you know, when they didn't come there for a few days when Dad was gone, we were kind of like was lost. lost. Mom was lost. She was lonesome. She says, you know, I miss those people. She said, sure they become a family. At home is probably the best thing that we could have ever had happen because everybody comes here, like the kids come here, um, the great grandkids come. So, and dad is much happier at home. Like we can see now, he cannot wait to come home. So he, when he's at home, he's happy. Even if there's nobody, just the TV and the radio, at least he, I guess, feels comfortable in his own environment. So 6.45, she phones me. She says, Judy, dad is screaming something unbelievable. So I come in. Yeah, he's all on the floor, except his head is just leaning against the bed. So we put a slider under him, and we kind of slide him down, put a pillow under his head, we put a quilt over him. Then we started to put the sling under, and I said to Dennis, you know, maybe he, something is, maybe I better call somebody, and I didn't know who to call. So the first person I called was uh, Steve from the paramedics. I can attest to that, that day yeah. that dad got sick, because you kind of took it over, off of my shoulders to get him to the hospital and arrange that because right away Donna called that there's a bed available. Like that made it so much easier on me. Like because I have to stay here and kind of stay with mom. And then you took over and then when we took dad then it was all all relieved. Like it just helped so much. You just know what to do. And then your calls yeah. were so reassuring because you guys reassured us that this will happen, that'll happen. And and then if things get better home care will be reinstated. Like, you gave confidence in us that things are going to happen the way they should happen, and they are happening, which is very, very, very appreciated. Very. To be honest, I think my dad probably would have died from uh, depression. Uh, what would you call that? He would have been so down so upset, so withdrawn, that I think he probably would have been way first, uh, further uh, gone with his dementia than he presently is because he would have been just so upset with everything. I call them my angels. I truly believe in them, and I know that they'll, they'll be there for a long time to help us with everything that comes along our way. Whether it's good or bad, mostly bad things come. <laughs> but they go away with your help. I call them, they're my stars from <laughs> up above. That's what you are to me. I think they have to realize the exceptional people they have working below them. That it's unbelievable that these people are so great and so knowledgeable and so dependent that they deserve all the credit and appreciation that you can offer to anybody.
So just as he's pulling that back up, you know, there's a couple of key messages in there. You look at the, the patient flow or the navigation through the system, and she said, I needed to be here when things weren't going well with Adolf and not worrying about how do I get care. And, and our team collaborating together, we were able to take that off of her shoulders so that she could really focus on her mom and um, provide the support that she needed to. So really an amazing initiative and when we first started it, we, we actually kind of said, how long do you think this will go on for Kelly? And she's like, I don't know, a month. 13 months later, um, Adolf then went into respite and died um, a week after that. So 13 months of keeping this gentleman where he wanted to be was, was really amazing. Lots of learnings um, to develop this program. We modified, we improved as we went, we did the stop the line, we did what we had to do. So as an administrator, we're always taxed to try to figure out how do we make a difference. And we've got piles of data you've seen up there. It's just amazing. But after Adolf died, Kelly phoned me and he's like, you're never gonna guess what. And I'm like, okay, what happened? Like, what's, what's going on? Like, he's passed away, what more could happen? <laughs> like, what's next? And he said the family phoned and asked Steve if he would be an honorary pallbearer at Adolf's funeral. And I thought, okay, all of the qualitative and quantitative data that we've ever collected, who cares? That has told us we've done the right thing. Um, my, my boss has told me when we get a little bit frustrated, he says, you know, Sherry, we're not worried about saving lives anymore. We're worried about changing lives. So this, I think this was a life changer for this family and for Adolf and um, a lot to be learned from this family, so. And just a final note, our from the paramedic standpoint with Adolf and his family, we just didn't come into their life and leave their life. We are still engaged with Margaret. Twice a week, my paramedics head over there for coffee just to have a conversation. And that makes all the world a difference to that family. We, many times they invited us over for supper. There would be times that I would go to assist the lift and have 14 dozen progies in my lap <laughs> by the end of the day. So that's not only what the paramedics meant, but the care aides. We would sit, we would have coffee, we just didn't come in there and do the job and leave. We engaged the family. I think we all lost about 10 pounds after Adolf passed away, because yeah. you never left the house without having cake or pierogies or something. <laughs> yeah. so. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you very much. I get to see a lot of people do a lot of community paramedic presentations and I got to say that what moves people that haven't heard of what we do the most is the case studies and the stories like we just heard. So if you're talking to a new audience about community paramedicine, those are the moving stories that get people excited. And our next session for today is the um, is Lori Langenfurth, the CEO of the Saskatoon Provincial Heart and Stroke Foundation, talking about integrating community paramedics into heart and stroke initiatives. Lori? Can you guys see me over here? Can you hear me? Um, very happy to be here today. Thanks for including us in your, um, in your session today. I'm just going to make sure that I can... Haha. -ha. So as Gary said, I'm Lori Langeforth. I'm the CEO for the Heart and Stroke Foundation um, in Saskatchewan. Full disclosure, this is not my line of work. I'm a fundraiser by trade. So um, I will do my best to answer any questions that you have. I do have a top end knowledge to give you guys some good information here. So, BC and Winnipeg are two examples of some of the great work that paramedics do in partnership with the Heart and Stroke Foundation across Canada and work that we do in every province. Uh, BC Pad Champs, we have 200 trained paramedics. What they do is they deliver orientation session, sessions to sites, provide input on placement of AEDs, maintenance, use, um, help develop emergency protocols and site plans, debrief staff and volunteers post any event, and assist, with, and assist with AED data. They also make referrals to trauma counseling if required, and that's all that's happening in BC. 
Um, the Winnipeg Fire and Paramedics Association of Manitoba does training, AED placement assessments in facilities to assist them on where best to place units and they run mock codes to help facilities re review their action, pa action plans. So in partnership with the Public Agency of Canada, uh, Heart and Stroke recently com completed a three-year program. 3,234 AEDs were placed across Canada in hockey arenas, recreation centers, and community centers. And this was all done with AED fund, or sorry, with uh, federal funding. You'll be interested to know that we know of at least 10, 10 lives saved as a result of this program so far. And there's many, many that, of course, we probably haven't heard of through the Heart and Stroke Foundation. In combination of training bystanders coupled with publicly placed AEDs, it really improves the chances that someone will respond and that their efforts will um, increase survival rates. In October of 2015, the latest guidelines for ECC and CPR were released. These guidelines are part of a vigorous five-year review which includes a review of new research and evidence relating to resuscitation and first aid. ILCOR plays a pivotal, pivotal role in updating the guidelines. Heart and Stroke Foundation is both a founding member and the only Canadian member um, of ILCOR. ILCOR representatives include well-respected paramedicine professionals. Um, adult chain of survival is split into two chains. One for in-hospital and one for out-of-hospital systems of care. The new basic life support training incorporates a dual stream design um, supporting education in both pre-hospital and in-facility in providers. So these three major trials are examples of involvement of paramedics, EMS, um, fire, and um, or in rocks research. Paramedics, EMS providers and fire were represented in the pre-hospital EMS Committee of Rock. This group was critical in providing important operational and implementation issues to the investigators, researchers, um, ensuring that all trials were not only scientifically sound but pragmatically possible for paramedics taking part in these trials. Uh, the data collected and interventions um, conducted as part of this trial were, or trial were done by paramedics, EMS, and fire personnel. Never before has such a consistent data, including features of an arrest or injury, been gathered on location. So CanRock is working with uh, EMS professionals across Canada to set up sites in every province. So let's take a look at the reality of stroke in Canada. Uh, the impact of stroke in Canada can be devastating. Statistics reveal that approximately 50,000 strokes occur in Canada each year. It's also known that there are approximately 300,000 Canadians living with stroke and someone has a stroke about every 10 minutes in Canada. Research has shown that persons who have a stroke have a 20% chance of having a second stroke within the next two years. This raises the concern and need for aggressive secondary prevention management. For any, every clinical evidence stroke, there are as many as nine covert strokes that result in cognitive impairment. Each one of these statistics highlight the importance of initiating system change and implementing best practices recommended to prevent strokes in the first place. Para paramedics need to be called for early management and transport as they recognize and mobilize. Paramedics address urgent needs, blood pressure and heart rate. They gather important information to establish stroke onset time, existing health conditions, or medications and allergies. Can get stroke patients to the most appropriate hospital more safely and efficiently than if they'd been driven for by a family member or friend. They know the bypass agreements and will bypass closer hospitals and take a stroke patient to one equipped to provide specialized stroke care. Especially important as our population ages and the number of strokes in those under 65 increases. 
paramedics working in community outreach also have a key role in risk factor education and management. And this is one of the things that we've actually been really working a lot on in Saskatchewan particularly, is the fact that we still have so many people that don't call 911, drive themselves to the hospital, and it's that window of time. And it's not just the calling 911 and recognizing the signs of a stroke, it's ambulance fees, it's all those different things that are in, that we're addressing. And the Heart and Stroke Foundation is fully invested in helping to try and figure out the best way to change some of those statistics. Sorry, changing my slides before I'm ready. So Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada adopted the, the FAST for signs of stroke in 2014. And we're working closely with EMS in Saskatchewan and across the country. In Saskatchewan, over 200 ambulances now have the FAST um, signs on them. So that's something that we've been working with them for this past year. And we're very grateful for all of the different communities for putting that on. I see it everywhere I go and it's wonderful for us. We know of, um, with this campaign in Saskatchewan, we know of two saves, um, not from the ambulances specifically where they're seeing it, but from the TV commercials. And um, like I said, we know of two people and one of them was a young lady in her 30s that was saved. She saw a commercial on FAST the week before and said to her husband, if you ever see any of this in, in me, please call 911. She did and she walked out the following day. So this is a little bit about the times. Um, we know that 32% 30, of stroke patients arrive within three and a half hours. 37% of patients arrive within four hours. Patients in their 20s and 30s take the longest, eight hours versus six, hour, six hours for 40-year-olds um, and older. There's still this idea that young people don't have strokes. So it really is imperative for the Heart and Stroke Foundation that people know the signs of stroke, that paramedics know how to use FAST and are getting the people, the bypass protocols, getting all that in. Um, we've done a lot of work with that, um, a lot in, in Saskatoon as well. But there's some really, really good uh, processes in place. A uh, picture of a mobile stroke unit that has a CT scanner right in it. And the Frontier trial, um, it's a new Canadian developed drug that is actually being administered by paramedics to stroke patients who are within the three hour window of onset. And just a little bit of a plug, we've got the Canadian Stroke Congress in Quebec City in September, so something that hopefully that you guys will join us for. Really, thank you for taking the time to um, have us today. It was a really pleasure showing, sharing with you some of the ways that we're currently working together and hope that this is a trend that will continue and that we'll find more ways to work together in the future. Okay, we're going to do a little small group activity now. So, Anne, we're going to end the stream and we'll begin the stream again tomorrow morning promptly at 8 o'clock with our first session.